talk about something different. We're here to talk about the so-called big economy, the on-demand economy, some call it, or the world of algorithmic management, as others might call it. <laughs> this first topic, a changing model of work or exploitation. What is going on in the world of work at the moment? That's really what this first topic is looking at. And I suppose uh, when you think about a changing world of work, we're led to believe, aren't we? We're encouraged to believe that that old model of working, the traditional nine-to-five job, no longer exists or shouldn't exist. And in fact, we now live in a brave new world where we're free to work as much or as little as we want. But the reality is, for most people in this new world of work, they're unlikely ever to enjoy the flatbed comforts on a flight to Australia. Most of them are much more likely to be working for the likes of Sports Direct. The TUC has estimated that over the last five years there's been a 27% increase in the number of people with no guaranteed working hours and not even basic employment law rights. The number of people classified or classifying themselves as self-employed now stands at something like 5 million in our economy with about 27 people in more traditional working roles. So we don't need to sacrifice employment law rights in order to gain that degree of flexibility. And I suppose you could take it back even to employees. The right to request flexible working exists even for employees. So it's a false trade-off. I'm giving up my employment law rights for a flexibility and a freedom that's illusory and that I could probably have anyway. And that's why we say it's not just a changing model of work. It's exploitation. To the man who you <laughs> see to be, to be the acceptable face of this, uh, of this stance. The truth is, he's a Luddite. He's dragging you back to a past. He's dragging you back to an economic past that no longer reflects the reality. Changing for the good that people are able to flex, choose when to work or not work, mix their employers. 35% of the US working population now have more than one employer or regard themselves as being freelance or self-employed. Now, he will say, you're losing protection. You haven't got those traditional models of job security. Well, yes, there's a definite problem there for the future about how we're all going to survive financially when we start to see the technology embrace losing drivers in driverless cars or using aspects. Well, that's a more radical problem. That requires us to look at how we tax businesses, how we draw the value out of that generation. But you pick the wrong target if you think the businesses are about exploitation. They're about embracing technological change. And technological change is giving people choice. It's giving them the flexibility to work in the way that they want. But really, this question is, is it possible to avoid worker status or is auto cleanse always the trump card? We know that there are effectively three categories of status in the workplace. There is the true self-employed, self-engaged, independent contractor. There is, on the other extreme, the classic employee in an employment relationship. And then in the middle, we have the status of the worker, as Jason described it, who share actually a large range of rights, particularly minimum national minimum wage, holiday pay, rest breaks, and large areas of the protection in relation to anti-discrimination and whistleblowing. And typically, they don't share rights about unfair dismissal. But those have been where the battleground lies. And there, as one of the cases describes them, armies of lawyers have set about drafting the language of contracts. That was a lot of what the Uber case was about, the language of the contracts, and whether or not it was possible in that contract to make the, the individual's relationship that of an independent contractor and not a worker. Now, Jason will tell you that substitution doesn't really go on in a genuine sense, but actually, if it's possible to build a model where people can share the workload between one another, genuinely for substitution, then the reality is it is possible to contract out. The other area that we have definitely seen being used as a model to contract out is where, and this is relevant to those interested in IR35, is where the structure is built around the individual having their own corporate entity and providing their services. Because the way the definition works, it's definitely the case that if, in fact, you've got a genuine independent business that you're contracting with, it doesn't fit within worker status. So it is possible. It's not easy. And most importantly, the reality of what happens on the ground, use of substitution, flexibility, and the ability to choose when and where to work 
have to reflect the contract. The contract has to really specify it, but people have to do it. And if that is the case, it is genuinely possible to avoid worker status. We don't speak to any of the individuals. We don't know what they're actually doing. Very little instructions about what they're actually doing. We are the armies of lawyers that David referred to, tweaking documents in order to ensure that people fall outside employment protection most of the time. That's what we do. Okay. What this question is asking is, is it still possible to do that? Is it still possible to just draw up documents in order to ensure that people don't get employment rights? Okay. And all the Supreme Court said in the case of Water Cleanse and Belcher is, well, yes, as long as the document reflects the actual relationship between you and those individuals. If they do genuinely have a right of substitution, and that's incorporated into a contractual term, then they're very unlikely to be workers, and they certainly can't be employees. Any piece of work you want, at any time, you can send a substitute, because, of course, a clever lawyer, lawyer knew that that meant she couldn't possibly be a worker or, or an employee. But she worked on the hospital circuit. She was picking up blood samples and, for, uh, uh, and um, other sort of human matter to deliver from one hospital to another. Often it had to be done at great speed, so she had security clearance to get into the hospital. And that security clearance had her photograph on it, her name on it, and she had to go through a series of tests to be authorised to go into those hospitals and pick up those samples. There was absolutely no way that she could just give that to one of her mates and say, I've decided to send a substitute. It was never going to happen. But she'd been issued with a standard form contract that was also issued to van drivers delivering pots of paint and the like in all the different parts of the country. And the tribunal had no hesitation in saying, well, that might apply to the van drivers and their pots of paint. It just doesn't apply to you. And so we're going to look at what actually happens in your case. What's really going on here? Why, why such a focus on the changing world of work and the way in which people are now working? Why has the government shown such interest in, in the world of work? The government, of course, appointed, I mean, it lost count of quite how many reviews there have been of employment status, but the tailor being the very latest and about to produce its report. Is it because of real concern about the plight of employees and the loss of employment protection? Or is there, is there another agenda here? Has anyone here, did anyone have experience of using the online tool? The online tool that determines whether someone is an employee for tax purposes or ought to be treated as an employee for tax purposes. And there was a delay in introducing the online tool. You know why there was a delay? Because the people designing it were independent contractors. <laughs> and when they realised that the effect of the changes, that they were going to be worse off, they all declined to carry on working. And I'm told with good authority that is the true reason why there was a delay in introducing that tool. So yes, we say that actually fundamentally this isn't necessarily about uh, wanting to protect employees. It's more a question of, um, uh, of trying to increase the government's tax take. And it's only fair to do that if you're going to look at um, protecting rights for those who are otherwise going to be worse off. Most of the people who are in the flexible self-employed workforce weren't doing the sort of things which have hit the headlines. And in fact, 59% of them were doing professional or creative or administrative tasks. Indeed, they were the sort of people who you might traditionally have been regarded as being self-employed. So, so there seems to be quite a lot of interest about this topic being generated about quite a small group of people. So is the reality that the interest is actually a slightly bigger picture? And it, is, it must be a bigger picture because it's true. The number of self-employed people in this country has grown significantly in the last few years. Now 5 million of the working population are self-employed for tax purposes. And you only have to look at the loss of the national insurance take on that to recognise that there is a significant impact on a government and any colour government that is looking for the purpose of getting its tax uh, affairs in, in, in place. Um, if you looked at the Labour manifesto and the Conservative manifesto in their approach to worker status or those basic rights, you don't find much difference because the truth of it is that even for the Conservatives for the last few years, part of their big banner has been minimum wage and worker protection because they wanted to seize that particular ground. That isn't a centre ground anymore, that's common ground. 
So we have to separate that out from the whole tax question. If tax is what it's about, let's solve the tax problem. If it's about protecting the lower pay, well, that's fine. We can all agree about that. But let's do that in a different way rather than worrying about how we define particular statuses or arrangements. Are you working when you are waiting to work? And it popped up in Uber. One of the, one of the issues in Uber was a, a case that the minimum wage was being broke for one of the claimants. And the particular claimant, Uber's case, was that the particular claimant uh, had declined 80% of the jobs which were offered to him in a two-week period but was still driving around. And the result is that his earning level fell by about 70% for that particular window. And the tribunal found that whenever he was driving, he was, and with his app switched on, he was working. Now, the critical issue here is a legal issue. And it's a legal issue that actually still is being thrashed about at one level. This is David's sour grapes argument, really, isn't it? <laughs> this is the employer who's lost. It turns out that when I do tell you when to work and where to work and you know, punish you if you don't turn up when I say you should, um, yes, it turns out you're one of my workers, even though I called you a generally self-employed contractor. Oh, well, here's the sting in the tail. I'm only going to pay you for that stingy bit of time when I can prove you're actually working. And I'm not going to pay you for all the other time that you sat there waiting for a job. And it's okay if you're in a nice warm car, but if you're a cycle courier and it's the dead of winter and you're standing outside freezing yourself to death, that's not working time. So waiting time should count as working time. It's really not that complicated. It gets complicated when you talk about modern technology, and this is the sort of the, the floodgates argument. This is scaremongering. Oh yes, but what if you've got two, three or four apps on your phone, which means you could be waiting for any number of different companies? Sure, there are going to be complications. And David will always raise the prospect of the individual who drives around turning down all the jobs, but actually then claiming that as working time. There are always going to be bad people that exploit the system. There are in every walk of life. But the few bad people that exploit the system shouldn't determine how we interpret the law. And the law is pretty straightforward. If I'd made myself available to you to do whatever work you require of me, then for that period of time I'm working. So they do also serve who wait. Who was going to appeal? End of September. Um, City Sprint is going it's to... also going to appeal. Yeah. And it was originally listed in October on a date I couldn't do. And, and it's is now going trust. to be rearranged, I think, Excellent. for probably November, December. So right. that case will go to appeal. This is Employment Appeal Tribunal. Yeah. Um, they're likely, potentially, to go to the Court of Appeal. Um, we're talking slow, I'm afraid. We are talking slow. At the moment... Getting from the EAT to the Court of Appeal is going to take about 18 months. There's an interesting point here. There's a new procedure that's been introduced that allows cases to apply to leapfrog the Court of Appeal to go from the EAT to the Supreme Court. Now, I'm, I understand that Pimlico Plumbers are going to try and get permission to go to the Supreme Court. I don't know if, David, you know whether they have or haven't. No, I don't know. I saw Tom on last yeah. week. I didn't ask him. I should have done there's a sense at the moment there's an awful lot of these cases coming through and there's an opportunity for the Supreme Court to kind of group them all together. You know, why have Pimlico Plumbers and Uber and CitySpin all proceeding separately? Why not get all of these cases together and let the Supreme Court have an opportunity to say something sensible about employment status? So there's an outside chance that might happen with these cases. I'd be quite keen to try and avoid Court of Appeal, not least of all because of the delays it brings in. Is, is there not a danger that... Um Actually, a tribunal one day will say, well, I know you're not asserting employment status, and this was a misconception in the press, was that people were, were trying to become yeah. employees, and they absolutely weren't, because they, don't, they, they wanted, presumably, the tax benefits of being self-employed. But isn't there a danger that some tribunal, um, and then the EAT and one particular facts will say, I know you're not really saying you uh, that you want to be employees, but I'm actually going to make a finding that you are employees, in which case then um, there's, it might backfire, essentially. I think that itself is unlikely to happen. But, but also, I do you know that Lee Day, that is what they want. So, um, well... Which is the firm <laughs> behind this case, because I heard them say that. Yeah, so, yeah. I mean, there's an established line of authority that says tribunals can only decide the cases and the issues that are put in front of them. So if you expressly say, I do not want you to decide the question of employment status, if a tribunal were to do that, I think the employer would have a, a safe ground of appeal in relation to it. But it might arise in a slightly more subtle way, in which 
uh, say an individual appears before an employment tribunal and the employment tribunal says to that individual, we think actually you might be an employee, yes. would you like to amend your claim yeah. to, to so allege? Mm -hmm. uh, and then of course it would be up to the individual if they choose to amend. Mm -hmm. um, it's whether um, we think Matthew Taylor might enhance employer, employee rights. Um, mm. to something equivalent to France. I mean, in, in a world where in the next um, 18 months, lots of businesses are going to be competing for establishing, maintaining yeah. their yeah. employment base in the United Kingdom mm. against Europe, mm. a Conservative government <coughs> that advocates if they are still in control, increasing employee rights to reflect the French, is going to be like a hole in the head from yes. the yes. view of their... Yeah. It, it, whatever yeah. he says, yeah. that is never going to happen. Yeah. Can I just ask, with work of employees, does custom and practice come into play at all? So, so I think the, answer, the short answer to that is yes, in the, in the sense that you mean it. Will people look at what actually happens in that, in that sense? So um, Lord Justice Underhill is probably one of the most conservative Court of Appeal judges, with a small c, but his, was, his practice was representing the National Coal Board in, you know, during the miners' disputes and the like. Um, and he was the one, in, in the case of Windle, that David was talking about, found against the interpreters on the basis that really technical point of law, but the fact that you, you're free to come and go as you please, turn work down as, as you like or not, says something not only about your status between pieces of work, but reflects on whether you can be a worker when actually working. Um, and that's all that Windle really says. He revisited that in the Pimlico Plumbers case, and he actually did say in the context of mutuality of obligation, if in practice you spend most of your working week working for a particular company, a particular provider, then that's going to count very heavily in terms of showing that whatever the contract says, you are in fact a worker. And he's a conservative uh, employment judge. So absolutely, custom and practice can be very relevant. I'd really like to thank David and Jason very much. Um, and I um, hope you'll stay for drinks. And also, could you please fill in the feedback forms which are on your chairs? It'd be really great if you do that. Um, so before we break for uh, drinks and a bite to eat, just a note for your diary. Um, our next event is on 11th of July in the evening. Um, it's our final event of the season. We then go on a summer break for August, very well deserved, I'm sure. Um, and our speaker is Carrie Birmingham, who is from the world of newspapers. She was formerly the HR director for uh, News UK. She's going to be talking about um, trust in employees. She's going to be talking about the uh, the demise of the news of the world and the phone hacking scandal. It should be a really interesting uh, session. So um, please do come along as well. So